think about the five most people you hang out with and are those the people you truly want to be and become and ask yourself that and be real with yourself because if it's not you need to reevaluate who you're hanging out with and who you should start hanging out with and in my personal opinion I'm going to start trying to do this too by reaching out to more famous trainers and businessmen but try to hang out with people that are just flat out better than you because what you're trying to become is who you should hang out with and if you're hanging out with those people more on what you're trying to become you're actually going to get to your destination faster you're listening to off the court a show dedicated to making you the best version of yourself as an athlete and as a person i'm coach jack ceo and owner of close the gate hoops if you want to take your life and game to the next level this is the podcast for you let's get it what up gatekeepers back at you with another episode of off the court episode four play as one today i finally got my co-host back with me sam how we doing today i'm doing good thanks for having me on i'm happy to be home for the holidays of course i'm happy to have you too so recap of last episode episode three being addicted to productivity so our downloads, we're over 350 downloads collectively between the three episodes, but episode one had 200 and the episode downloads have slowly declined as each episode has been released. So I strongly urge you guys to stay up to date, subscribe, turn those notifications on so you don't miss any updates with these episodes. They will be coming out every single Sunday. And we have overproduced the next one to two months of episodes. So we're not going to run out of content for you guys. Again, we want more critique. One of the critiques we got recently was more energy and fluidity. And that's definitely something that me, Sam, Aaron, and some of our other guests have been working on. The more we practice this, the better we're going to become. And if you want to become a part of the CTG family in any way, shape, or form, don't be afraid to reach out to any of us and tag along. I also strongly encourage you guys to check out the new CTG Shooting Academy if you're trying to take your game and shot to the next level. It's the perfect blend of the knowledge, the drills, and the mindset necessary to become an elite shooter. It's everything I could have ever wanted when I was trying to transform my shot. There's also a free secret video link in all of our bio descriptions of all of our social media pages and YouTubes. This video is what transformed me into an elite basketball player and it's what I use with all my students. If there was a secret sauce, I'd tell you that is it. Okay, so down to the meat and potatoes. What is play as one? Play as one is a saying that my dad would say for all the basketball teams that he would coach and he'd break out of the huddle saying, he would say play as, and then the team collectively would all yell one. What that actually means is that we want to play as a fist. So when we're trying to punch somebody, we're much stronger when all of our fingers come together into a fist and then punch together. This is the same concept as working as a team and we're all stronger and better when we're all collectively together. If one person's out of line, it ruins the entire hand. Imagine if you tried to punch somebody with your pointer finger out. Say the point guard's not doing his job of facilitating and making plays. If you've got a fist and the pointer finger is now sticking out, if you try to punch somebody, that's going to hurt the entire hand, just as it would hurt the entire team. And not only will not working together and talking about the metaphor as a fist, if someone's finger is out and not having an enclosed fist that's only not hurting you and not being able to punch as well but it's also inefficient and you're having to waste energy to have to try to fix the problem instead of everybody working together and in your life you'll always have to work with others and work in a team and if you work together and have good teamwork it makes all of your work easier and you really become more efficient as a collective that's that's really good. You obviously yourself's going to be hurt if you're not playing as a team, but you hurt others around you as well. So don't take down the entire ship. Yeah, exactly. So Sam played a ton of high school football and basketball. So he knows what it means, especially 
to embody what teamwork is. Do you want to talk about what teamwork is to you, Sam, and why you think it matters? Yeah, so like I said earlier and like what Jack just said, uh, team sports growing up really helped me in a lot of ways, and the teamwork aspect of that I think kind of curved me into what I am. And I also said earlier, you don't stop working with people. Um, freshman year and sophomore year of college, that's I'm a sophomore currently, so that's my experience. And we've been having to be in a lot of groups and teams for my classes, like group projects or, or clubs. So getting what I got out of team sports has really helped me in that aspect as well. So I think teamwork is one of the most valuable aspects that someone could have and being a team player is one of the more desirable characteristics I think I would look into someone if I want to work with them and I'd like to start off with a quote from the Bible in the chapter four of Ecclesiastes it's two people are better off than one for they can help each other succeed if one person falls the other can reach out and help but someone who falls alone is in real trouble Likewise, two people lying close together can help each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. And that quote just kind of shows like what we've been saying. It all Teamwork helps you succeed and achieve your goals and is more efficient than working alone. And what do you think about that, Jack? I, I just think it's crazy how relevant the Bible is to a lot of things that happen in the world today. But everything said in that verse is so, so true. And the warm thing, that really hits me because especially just in general, you never want to go through life alone. And we'll dive a little deeper into this later. But when you're trying to go through something right now, and that's a huge reason why I am always advocating for people to tag along and join me for Close the Gate, and that's why I did the podcast with you. It's not as fun when you do something completely alone. It's so much better when you have other brains and minds to bounce off of and just to have all these successes together. Like when me and Sam's podcast hit 150 downloads on the first night, like I was super stoked for that, and then I could in return – talk about that excitement with Sam. If I was doing that alone, I would have no one to talk about it with. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and when you're working with a team and other people, part of that excitement that you share with others and bonding that you have comes from team chemistry. And team chemistry uh, kind of goes hand in hand with teamwork. And I think it's one of the most crucial things for a team to succeed. And what are some cases, uh, good and bad, of team chemistry that you faced and how has it affected the team that you worked with? So not only, I forgot to mention this earlier, not only do you share excitement, but you also can share the downfalls as mm -hmm. well. That's why you always need someone else and a team with you. But in terms of examples of bad and good team chemistry, an example of good team chemistry just recently would probably be the Miami Heat reaching the NBA Finals in 2020 because they probably out of all the teams in the playoffs in terms of talent they probably had the 10th best team in the playoffs in my personal opinion they have a lot of great pieces but they blended so well together in terms of their personality and how they're all grinders and workers they had the best team chemistry by mm -hmm. far and it just goes to show you you don't need to be the most talented team to have success. It's all about the blend and what you guys are striving and working for if you actually all truly share those successes and downfalls. Like comparison is the thief of joy. You don't want to have one teammate getting mad at another teammate for their successes. You should have true empathy and compassion for their success. You shouldn't be comparing your own returns and gains to what you've been working for to other people. And this goes throughout all facets of life. I know a ton of adults that struggle with this. And my dad, I remember when I was growing up, he would tell me all the time when he was a young adult, he would look at all these parents rolling into SJV with 
BMWs and all these fancy cars. And he used to say how you he'd used to think to himself, you know, why can't I have that for my kids? Why can't I give my kids better gifts on Christmas? And obviously, as you mature and you get older, your brain develops. But that was a perfect example of comparison as the thief of joy for my dad. It took away the joy of what he was working for and the things he was doing by comparing the results of others. Yeah, and I think to have good team chemistry, one of the most important things would just be to look at everybody as equals and not value one person's opinion greater than someone else's and be able to bounce ideas off of each other and all stand for the same thing and have the same core values and same goals because if you do that, then you'll you'll trust everybody and you'll know that everybody will want to work together and have good teamwork and be good teammates to be able to achieve whatever you're trying to. And I just think being a teammate to me, I found this quote online. I don't know who it's by, but it really embodies just what teamwork is and what being a teammate is to me. It's don't aspire to be the best on the team, aspire to be the best for the team. And that just really means your main goal isn't about you, it's about us and it's about we. It's about achieving the main goal, whether it's winning or whatever your goal is. It's all about if you achieve that goal, not anything personal or something that will just affect you. It's something that will actually affect the whole team. Yeah, play as one really means we over me. And a lot of people don't understand this, but you actually get more individual success when you're focused on more about the team and we. It's just a byproduct of what it means to actually work with teamwork. Yeah, and if you asked any athlete, would you rather win MVP or win a championship? The correct answer should 100% be championship. But unfortunately... I think a lot of people might say MVP, and I think if you look at that, whatever team that person's on and they said MVP, it probably wouldn't correlate to a lot of success because of that intrinsic goals instead of the goal as a team and team sports, which is winning. No, that's a really good example, and when you're trying to compare the greatest of all time, it's never about... Obviously, MVPs has a part to play in it, but it's more about the rings and how they made their team that much better. Exactly. And being a great teammate is something that everyone can control and I think everyone should try to be and try to attain. And to me, there's just a few things that every teammate should do and what it takes to be a great teammate. And I think a great teammate gives maximum effort. A great teammate builds relationships with their teammates, like we talked about chemistry. A great teammate has a positive attitude, including optimistic mindset and displays positive body language. A great teammate is willing to give and accept criticism. A great teammate is reliable, honest, and trustworthy. And a great teammate knows their role. And Jack, I know that was a lot of information, but would you like to touch on a few of those and what you think of them? So I definitely have a few examples from individual impaired workouts that I do. So definitely a great teammate gives maximum effort. And a prime example of this, I was working out my two of my most kindest students by far, genuine people, is Ike and Blake. And they were doing a drill. It was a finishing drill. They do a split drop to a finish. I got on them a little bit because I didn't think they were giving maximum effort. And once I was giving them this whole speech on how much big of a difference it is between giving 80% effort and 100% effort, and after I said that, they seriously jumped a whole 50% in game speed. And by game speed, I'm meaning when you're trying to get by someone in a game, it's maximum explosion and effort. It's a lot harder to simulate that when you're by yourself. So I remind kids by saying game speed a lot. But it was such a good thing and a bad thing at the same time because they were coachable. They listened to me and they went a lot harder. But in return, they were going so much slower in terms of their game speed before I said that. So only you can truly know if you're giving maximum effort. I can visually see it, but I don't know if that's 100% to you or not. 
So you have to be mentally strong and tough in always pushing yourself to give maximum effort. Because if you're giving maximum effort all the time, you're giving not only yourself, but your team the best possible chance to achieve the ultimate goal of winning. Yeah, and if you're not giving max effort, you're also cheating yourself and the team, and you're hindering success and holding your team back. Well, a lot of times, too, we can slip out of it without even knowing we're giving maximum effort by just doing the same thing over and over again. To give maximum effort, you always have to be focusing on giving maximum effort. I can say this from past experience. When I would do something over and over again, I would lose focus on it a little bit and I'd care more about the time that I was spending on it than what I was actually doing. And there was this really, really good quote I read in a book the other day, focus on being productive and not busy. And this is an extremely important quote if you read into it. It's not about the time you put into things, you guys. It's about what you do with the time that you're working on. So if you're always giving maximum effort with less time working out, you're going to see so much more results and gains than if you were focused on, all right, I'm going to get four hours of shooting in today, but I'm going to walk after every rebound and do every single shot, not game speed, because I think I'm putting in more work than everyone else because I'm out in the gym for a longer period of time. It's not about busy work. It's about being productive. How hard are you actually going in your workouts? Yeah, if you're practicing lousy stuff and giving half effort that's really wasting your time and you could achieve more in less time so it's really about being efficient work hard and smart together this is something that i didn't understand until recently you can work less for more if you have more knowledge about what you're doing i only focused on working hard so putting in the most time compared to everyone else when I really should be focused on working hard and smart. It's about what I do during that time to maximize my returns and gains. In terms of building relationships with teammates, the better relationship that you have with teammates, the better your team is going to be. And from past experience, our immature minds on our Craig basketball team, we had a few teammates that would all, always bicker. And it was between me and one of my other good buddies that actually was best friends growing up with, we would always fight over who was better, which is such a stupid thing to fight about because everyone individually is good at their own things. But this bickering at in return hurt the entire team because of it. Even though it was only involving two people, the entire fist was hurt because of it. And in return, our team chemistry was worse and hurting our chances of the ultimate goal of winning. And obviously we're still young, we're still growing up, and that's a common thing for people to fight over who's better than who, but everybody's different. You have your own individual talents, everyone brings something different to the table. And that gets into something that's extremely important in achieving the ultimate goal, which is winning, and that's knowing your role. This is something I've recently coached the Craig girls basketball team in the Dallas for a few tournaments. And the first thing I said to him at the first practice we had was knowing your role. Because in my opinion, this Craig girls roster is stacked. They have an extreme amount of talent, but their team chemistry is very hindered sometimes because people don't understand what knowing your role is. And knowing your role basically is to use your superpowers. And by superpowers, I mean, what's your greatest strength? So my superpower in high school was shooting. What I'm saying by these superpowers is there's a reason you're out on the floor right now and you have to be doing that reason. If you're not a three-point shooter and you're jacking up a bunch of threes, you're significantly hurting the team by not knowing your role. And again, this doesn't fall on the player most of the time. It's about the coach telling that kid what their role is, even though that you should know personally. But individual improvement is for your own time and your own workouts. You shouldn't be out there in a regular season game thinking, all right, I'm going to shoot more threes so I can get better at my own individual three statistic. That 
is going to destroy your team chemistry if you're thinking that way. If you want to shoot more threes in a game, then put in more time aside when you're in your individual workouts and get more three-point shot reps. Then once you become consistent to it, then yeah, you can start shooting more threes. But you have to understand what your role is. Another example is if the five-man, the center, gets a rebound and they start dribbling up the floor to make a play. Now this significantly hurts the team also because the role of someone who brings up the ball is supposed to be the point guard. And the reason they're the point guard is because they're going to make different plays to give the team the best chance to score. So a center bringing up the ball, they don't know who to pass it to, when to pass it to them to give the best chance to score. A point guard's been doing this their whole life, so they know who to pass it to, when to pass it to them, and what plays to make. So then in return, it gives them the best chance to win the game when the point guard is playing the role and the center is not. So if you're trying to improve your team's chances of the ultimate goal of winning, everyone truly needs to know their role. And another good example of knowing your role is Duncan Robinson. Jimmy Butler had this famous quote in the finals when Duncan Robinson's an outstanding three-point shooter. Like, he is a sniper. He's one of the best live three-point shooters I've ever seen. But one time, Duncan Robinson started dribbling inside the three-point line, and he ended up turning the basketball over. And Jimmy Butler started yelling at him, and he goes, I want you to shoot threes. Don't dribble inside the three-point line. And that's a perfect example of Jimmy's telling Duncan what his role is. The reason he's out there on the court is to shoot threes. So just use your superpowers and know what your role is to help your team have a better chance of winning. Yeah, and knowing your role is really all about being great at what you're good at. You're not expected to be able to do everything. and Nobody's perfect and that well-rounded. But what your thing is or your superpower, you're expected to bring that to the table and be able to contribute towards team success. You're not going to ask an accountant to go do HR work, and you're not going to ask an engineer to go do janitor work, and you're not going to ask a janitor to go do calculus, but you're going to expect them to do what their role is so it can be towards the greater good for the company. So really, you just got to bring to the table on what you're expected to bring, and when you're not with the team, you're expected to work on your other things and improve your overall, we'll say, game. If we're talking about basketball, you don't want to be working on the things that you need to improve during the game. You want to work on the things you need to improve on outside of the game. But when you're in the game, what you excel at, you're expected to excel at in the game. Uh, do you have anything to touch on that, Jack? That, that statement of the Janner head engineer is really, really good. But it also touches on how important each role is, no matter big or small. Because, again, you don't want the janitor to do the head engineer job, head engineer to do the janitor's job. But some people may say that the janitor's job is insignificant because they pay less. But the working environment would be so much worse if the janitor wasn't there in the first place. So their role, even though it's not as big as a head engineer, is so crucial and important for the overall business's success. Yeah, and that goes back to being a great team and achieving success. You really got to value everybody the same and treat everybody as equals. Everybody's there contributing and everybody's as important as the next. And it might not show, but... Without them, if you remove them, you'll see there's something missing and why can't we achieve this? Well, why aren't we winning? Uh, you'll notice when that person's gone, but you might not notice when they're there. So to all the older adults there, out there and parents, if you're struggling to find enjoyment and success with the job you're doing, I'm sure you have an extremely important role with whatever it is you're doing. And if you weren't there, the business would 100% be hurting worse. Always think your role is equal because it is. Because without you, again, a business's ultimate goal is achieving dominance, winning, being the best business out of all their competition. But without you there, that ultimate goal is hindered. And 
that's such a good statement, Sam, when you say that all roles are equal, because that's so true, not only in basketball, but in facets of our jobs when we get older as well. But in terms of how knowing your role leads to success, the two attorneys that I coached the girls basketball team, they absolutely destroyed every team that they played when they started playing their role. And their emotions were all as one, their mind was as one, and they were playing as one. And when I say emotions as one, as they were killing all these teams and having lots of success, everyone was amped up and happy about that success. We didn't have one player that was mad they weren't having as good of a game as they wanted to. Everyone's emotions were also as one. And the same theory applies. If all your emotions aren't in check and in one, and you got one point guard who's not happy with scoring enough points, then the entire hand is going to hurt when you try and punch. And that's the same concept as mind being as one. This famous quote by Vince Lombardi is so good. Knowing your role and being a great teammate and having that team chemistry achieves the ultimate goal of winning. And Vince Lombardi once said, winning is in everything, it's the only thing. Playing as one gives you the highest possible chance of achieving this. Yeah, I think to reiterate, everybody can play as one and everybody can be a good teammate. And teamwork is something that is very attainable. And if you do that, your chances of winning just skyrocket. And I think there's so many examples of teams that say, well, why didn't they succeed? And then you can look back at it and look that they had team chemistry issues or they had selfish players. And if you really come together and give it your all, even if you don't win, you'll at least be satisfied that you did give it your all and there was nothing holding you back. Exactly. We talked about this a little bit in one of the other episodes. I can't remember which one. But to get to the point of no regrets, you have to give maximum effort and do your best. Being the best possible teammate you can be and playing as one gives you the best possible chance of winning. And if you do that, you're not going to have any regrets toward it. And all the things Sam listed on being a great teammate by giving maximum effort, building relationships, willing to accept and give criticism, being reliable, honest, and trustworthy, and knowing your role, those are all things that you can control, which is such a huge advantage when you know that. So if you can control all those things to be a better teammate, then you should be going out and doing those things to maximize your team's chance of achieving the ultimate goal of winning. And you've been hearing us talk about if there's the finger outside of the fist, how it affects us. There are always going to be bad teammates, and you need to learn how to deal with bad teammates. And you can really use this as an opportunity for growth because that means your team can just be that much better once that teammate plays as one. And the first and most important thing to try to deal with that poor teammate is to not engage with the negativity. If I were to give some steps to try to deal with a bad teammate, I'd say number one is you got to be respectful. Um, You don't want to go in there and approach your teammate with a negative attitude because then it'll be emotions as one. Like Jack said, if you come in with negativity, then it'll rub off on your teammate and they won't look at it with an a positive mindset and an opportunity for growth. So in your conversation, just try to be polite. And at first, you should try a one-on-one conversation to not feel like you're ganging up on your teammate and to make it more sentimental and heartfelt. And if that doesn't work, maybe try a group of two or three and just to show that there's more people that think this way and it's not just you. And just tell them really what you think and what do you think they could they could change and if that's really not working uh, I would bring it up with their superior such as your boss or coach or professor or something just so it gets resolved and because obviously you'll want to achieve your goal and if they're holding you back you need to let your superior know if the issue isn't fixing So in terms of the one-on-one conversation, Sam, that's really good. Make sure you're doing these conflicts and problems in person because a lot of kids these day and age say they get into a huge argument almost every time it's over text. 
stop trying to resolve these big issues over text because it shows one it shows you're not confident and serious enough and you're actually scared to do it in person but it shows how serious of a problem it is when you go up to that person and talk to them in person so i urge you guys to stop trying to resolve conflicts over text you got to do those kinds of things in person face to face yeah that's a great point really make sure in person just makes it more interpersonal and more real and it shows real. that it's an actual issue and you actually want it resolved and i would say step two would be to listen um you got to ask questions on how your teammate feels and how they think they're doing and how the team's doing and you got to listen to their input because not everybody first off knows if they're being a bad teammate and sometimes they're not trying to be and Everybody has issues in their own life. People go through things and you don't want to assume anything. So you really got to ask them just to make sure that you're on the same page. And if they know they're being a bad teammate, then that's another story. But if they're oblivious to it, then it's a really good thing that you're talking to them and well, you just got to listen to. Most of the time, I hope nobody tries to be a bad teammate. Like, if you're not a three-point shooter and you're shooting a bunch of threes, you may not know you're being a bad teammate. But then in return, if you've got your friend and teammate who decides not to say anything about it, then they're also being a bad teammate by not speaking up and being honest and giving the team the best chance of winning. Yeah, exactly. And yet, just to reiterate, people are always dealing with things. So don't assume that you know what's going on with them. And this is talking about everything, not just dealing with bad teammates. Just don't assume that you know everything because you probably don't. Everybody has things they're going through and it, people might not try to bring it into their life, but it affects them in ways that they're not trying to have it. Have you read The Four Agreements? I have not. It's Tom Brady's favorite book and it's basically like, the four pillars that you should live your life by. And one of them is to never make assumptions because you never know what someone's going through. Exactly. That's, that's really good. And I have an example of for listeners who are trying to deal with a bad teammate. It's called the sweet and sour technique. So first you approach your teammate and you tell them something positive and good that you've noticed that they've been doing because there's always something positive uh, to look at and something positive someone brings to the table. But then after you do that, you confront them respectfully about the issue and then you kind of talk about what you think it's going on and how do you think it could be fixed and then again you t you listen and you ask them questions and listen to their input and you try to reach a resolution and you try to teach and learn at the same time from that teammate that's really really good sam so that's actually one of the first core values that my dad taught me to coach and train with when i was learning to become a trainer he would call it the sandwich technique so if you're ever trying say you're trying to fix something with one of the kids or students shots and something is out of place with their form you'd first as you're going up to them say something positive about their shot and then in the middle, you would talk about what you want to correct with their form and what you're trying to fix. And then after that, you'd end with something positive again. So you'd have this positive sandwich that's disguised as something positive when really we're trying to get the negative improved. That's very similar to what the sweet and sour technique is. Yeah, and if you guys want an example of this technique, uh, I have one. And I'm not trying to be negative towards Jack. He's just my partner here so i'm using his name jack you are our most talented player but you have to stop putting the blame on coaches and other teammates even if something is not your fault which sometimes it's not pointing fingers is bad for the team chemistry and overall the success of our team that's that's really good that's a perfect example of what most players actually go through if things aren't going for a right right for a player the first instinct and thing they're going to do is blame the other teammate or coach their problem. And guys, you have to realize people aren't against you. Like, say this happened to me a lot when I had my immature brain and thought everyone was against me. But 
say I was open in the corner and you were driving hard right, Sam, and my defender overhelped you and I was wide open. Say you didn't pass it to me, okay? In your head, you're not going, all right, I'm not going to pass it to Jack so he doesn't get more points. That's not what's happening most of the times. It's They just miss it sometimes. Kids make mistakes. People aren't against your success. And once you stop and realize that, you're going to be such a more happier and fluid and outgoing person when you realize that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, they're just trying to do what they think is best for the team and success. And that's where this conversation and talking with your teammates and building chemistry really matters because then you can be on the same page on what everyone thinks is best for the team. And after the game, then you can talk about what you think was good and good for the team and what you think could be done better and what you think shouldn't be done. And oh, go ahead, Jack. Well, most of the time we think it's just the way our thoughts are processed, but most of the time we think people's intentions are bad when in reality they're never bad. They just screw up and make mistakes, which is what we all do. Exactly. And if you've tried to uh, talk to your teammates and it's not really going well, you can always reassign toxic teammates to a role where they excel more. So maybe they're, they don't have as much responsibility, but the responsibility they do have is their superpower. So it's a smaller role, but they're being efficient in it. And that is something just you could do to kind of negotiate with the teammate so they're not affecting team success as much. Also, you can team a bad teammate up with someone who can carry their slack more so it kind of evens out and it will compensate for the weakness. And that's not really the first or second or third thing that you should want to do because it's unfair to that teammate that has to carry their slack. But sometimes if something needs to be done, that can be an option, but you should really try to talk to that teammate and let them know that they need to fix what they're doing. So do you want to give an example of that, Sam, like what that would look like, pairing up a bad teammate with someone who could pick up the slack? Or So I would say if there's a more negative teammate and they're kind of a blamer in that, I would pair it with one of your leaders of the team and someone that's really positive and someone that's not afraid to get on them and tell them what they're doing and start this conversation. So if it was a shooting drill and they're and this bad team, it's just in a terrible mood. I would put them with someone always in a good mood and accepting and willing to talk to them. So it can one change maybe that teammate's attitude or they're with someone that won't necessarily be affected by that negativity because they're in that positive mindset already. If you've ever heard the quote, you are the five most people that you hang out with, that is so, so true. Because the positive or negative attitude that you're hanging out with the most rubs off on you 100%. So that is a great tip, Sam, by pairing that blamer of a player and the excuse making player with the leader of someone who's always in a good mood because that good mood reinforced over and over again is somewhat going to rub off on the other teammate so if you're trying to find ways to improve facets of your life think about the five most people you hang out with and are those the people you truly want to be and become and ask yourself that and be real with yourself because if it's not, you need to reevaluate who you're hanging out with and who you should start hanging out with. And in my personal opinion, I'm going to start trying to do this too by reaching out to more famous trainers and businessmen. But try to hang out with people that are just flat out better than you. Because what you're trying to become is who you should hang out with. And if you're hanging out with those people more on what you're trying to become, you're actually going to get to your destination faster. Yeah, it's like the saying, you never want to be the smartest in the room. No, you never Because then do. you don't get better. Yeah, you're not learning then. That's really good. Yeah, so like I said, there's always going to be bad teammates. And at the end of the day, don't let them hold you back because then you're not going towards success. So just keep a good mindset and keep pushing forward and... 
don't deal with the negativity. And Jack was talking earlier about never going through life alone, and you said we'd get back to it. So what exactly were you talking about that, Jack? So one thing I'm trying to currently learn right now is collabs on social media. So you can grow your business much quicker when you reach out to your actual competition. And this is where most viewpoints on competition are actually flawed. You should view your competition as opportunities, not someone you're actually trying to better yourself then. Because you can use your competition to your advantage by trying to get your name in front of their audience also. So in terms of what a collab is, I recently just promoted another basketball trainer's vertical program, and he in return promoted my shooting program. So we're both bettering ourselves and getting our name out in front of more audiences by working together. Don't view others as someone that's trying to hold you back for success. You can use everyone in a positive light to actually better yourself. You just have to view competition as an opportunity. When you learn to play as one with everything in your life, even your competition, you'll start to see every facet of your life elevated. Yeah, that's great stuff. And like I said earlier, teamwork and teams never go away. So learning to be able to go through it with people, really crucial and beneficial. And that's what I was talking about earlier, sharing the excitements and downfalls. You're going to grow and excel much faster when you have other people to talk to that about and bounce ideas off of. And that's exactly why I wanted to do this podcast with Sam. If you just had one voice of ideas coming at you, you always want to be open to what's the word subjective or objective. I don't know. It's like in politics when someone's super left sided or right sided. Most of the time, it's because they're never open to other people's opinions. And that's the problem with polarization in our society today, in my opinion, is we're not open enough to hearing out the other side. And we don't let um, other opinions help evaluate and form our own opinion. We kind of just have one and we're like, all right, I'm not listening to anyone else's opinion. Mine's right. Yours is wrong. And that's such a flawed viewpoint. We need to be more open to what other people say and stop going through life alone. That's great stuff, Jack. <laughs> we won't get into politics. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think something that I'd really like to leave the listeners with is how to become a better teammate because it's something that you can always get better at and everyone can become a great teammate and I'd say it's the one thing that you can control the most and every single person should strive to be the best teammate that they can, that they can be. And I have three categories that I think every great teammate has. I think every teammate encourages, I think they're all reliable and I think they give all their effort. So in a basketball standpoint, uh, encouragement would be talking teammates up and being a great hype man, giving high fives, uh, giving compliments, stuff like that. And like what we talked about earlier, it just spreads that positivity and the uh, emotions as one. So if you're given encouragement all the time, then your teammates will give it back and then you'll have more team chemistry and a greater overall mood of the team. Well, that goes right back to perception as reality. If you try and say you're telling your teammate you're an insanely good shooter, and you might not have known, but they were mentally weak in terms of self-consciousness and confidence. And their perception now is that they're a really good shooter just because you said that one statement. And now they're going to perform better because of it. Because now the reality is that they're a good shooter just because you said that one tiny positive fact. Yeah, encouragement goes a really long way. And especially maybe if someone's having a bad day, if you just give them a positive thing about them that can really change their whole day and maybe their life or something. And I think reliability might be the number one thing that a teammate would have. You'll know it, you'll get out of me. I'll show up to meetings. I'll get my assignments done. I'll show up to workouts, give all my effort. I'll hustle. It's something that should be guaranteed from every teammate because what else would you do? Because giving all your effort like Jack said earlier, is how you achieve success. And 
if you're not giving it, you're cheating yourself and your team, and you're probably not going to succeed. And that's a common problem with most teams, in my opinion, that hinders that maximum potential of what they could have beat. Because a lot of times, teammates are not going to be accountable. So say you have optional workouts to go to for your high school team. That was a huge problem with our basketball team is not a lot of kids would show up to those optional ones. So they weren't very reliable in how soaked up and deep they were into the success of the team. Yeah, and if you can't rely on someone outside of the game, it's really hard to rely on them inside the game. And then that hinders success as well because you might not do what's best for the team because you might not trust them, even though they have their certain superpowers and their certain roles that they're expected to do. And you said earlier, a key foundation to being a great teammate is trust. And team chemistry, we told you earlier, that's the key to achieving the ultimate goal of winning. And if you don't have that trust, your fist is significantly weaker and you're not going to play as much as one. Lastly is effort. We keep reiterating this. Everyone can give all their effort and everyone is expected to give all their effort. Examples of this would be hustling every play, such as diving for loose balls and boxing out and setting good, hard screens, challenging teammates to bring out their best and give their max effort because then as a collective, you're giving more and you're getting better faster. Being a great practice player is really how your team improves. Your team doesn't improve much in game you improve out a game and if that's in season that's in practice so if you're being a great practice player then that's helping your team a lot more than if you scored a lot of points in one game if you're if you bring your all to practice every single time and you're being a great practice player that's helping your team tremendously and that all just comes from effort and your will if you if you want to win you will if you give all your effort and again That's something that only you know and can control. Only you know if you're giving max effort. You could look at someone and say, oh, he's giving maximum effort, when really in their mind they're only giving 95%. You have to be extremely soaked in and focused on what you're doing to give that maximum effort. But that gets us to the point of no regrets. And no regrets, that's a beautiful thing, and that's exactly where we want to be at any stage in our life. So... Before we wrap up this episode, I wanted to give you guys a book review related topic to what we're something that will help you with playing as one. And it's essential for leadership, communication, and teamwork. And this book is considered one of the best life books of all time. I read this a few years ago and I use all of these principles to date. So I strongly encourage you guys to go check out this book how to win friends and influence people. And the first pillar of this book are mental techniques for leadership or your business. So an example of this would be the fish hook theory. And what this is, is it talks about the metaphor of a fisherman fishing for fish. And this fisherman's favorite fruit is say watermelon. He doesn't put watermelon on the hook to go catch the fish. He puts worm on the hook to go catch the fish. So when you're trying to get somebody to do something for you, you have to intrigue them with something they want, not what you want. An example of this would be when you have, say you're running a weightlifting program to lose weight. You're not going to go advertise to more clients that the reason you want them to join is so you can have a bigger client list and make more money. You'd go say, I can help you lose 10 pounds in one month. That's the same exact type of thing with the fish hook theory. If you're trying to get somebody to do something for you, intrigue them with something they want. And that goes right back to confronting other teammates, Sam. If you're trying to fix a problem, don't go in and dive in right away with the result that you want. You have to think about what your teammate actually wants first. Another key pillar of this book is every single person has their own movie and When I read this, I really sat down and thought about it for a second because it was truly eye-opening. When you go throughout your day, you completely forget that all the other people you know in your life are in their own movie as well. 
we're so egocentric and egotistical with the way we live our life. We think that we're the star. And even if you change a small percentage of this by becoming genuinely interested in people and improving their life, not just your own, you're going to see drastic changes in every facet of your life. Never think that someone hasn't gone through something. And that's why we should never feel sorry for ourselves because we're all different. We all live different movies. We all star differently in our lives. And when we start to become genuinely interested in other people and understand that everyone's different, you're going to see everything throughout your life increase. One of the last things this book strongly encourages the readers to do is to admit when you're wrong emphatically. And what this means, he gives an example and metaphor with the cashier theory. So this cashier in this metaphor, he accidentally gave away $20 in change, an extra $20, and say he's making minimum wage, so seven fifty. So that's three hours of work he just gave away. And so in the first example, the boss gets super mad at the cashier, and it's like, you just gave away three hours of work, blah, blah, blah. But in the second example, the cashier admits he's wrong emphatically first by saying, I'm so sorry, that was an insanely big mess up. You should fire me right away. After this cashier admitted that he was wrong emphatically, the boss's response in return was like, oh no, it's not that big of a deal, it's only $20. And as you can see, the response of the superior was dramatically different than the first example when the cashier didn't admit that he was wrong emphatically. So if you wanna change people's responses to when you're wrong and make mistakes, admit you're wrong emphatically and the results are gonna come much easier and better for you. So no one's right all the time. So you really just gotta be humble and admit that you're, you are wrong a lot of times. People are probably wrong more than they are right and they don't really realize it. So if you admit that you're wrong when you're wrong, it also builds trust, which we've kept talking about and how trust leads to team success and team chemistry. So admitting you're wrong is something that everyone should do when you are wrong. So if you're trying to improve your leadership, social and teamwork qualities, I strongly recommend check out How to Win Friends and Influence People. It's been considered one of the best life books for over almost 100 years. It's It released like 91 years ago, and it shows how much of a true statement these pillars are since they're still relevant to today's day and age. You want to do a quick speed round, Sam? Yeah. I got my questions. Yep. So first, who's your NFL MVP right now? I got Patrick Mahomes. Are you serious? Yeah, the Chiefs are good. Dude. Rodgers leads him in every stat. I don't know. Other than yards. I'm just calling Mahomes. I, I'm honestly going to be pretty mad if Mahomes wins. Rodgers. Would Rodgers be the first one ever for three MVPs? I think. Mm, no, Favre won three in a row. So, dead or alive, two people you would sit down with? Jesus Christ and someone from Egypt so they can tell me how they built the pyramids. <laughs> That's really good. Jesus how about you? Christ. That's a good one. I answered this in the last episode. Okay. I said... Barack Obama, so I could learn how to speak like him, <laughs> and uh, my dad. That'd be cool. So, Jack, what is your favorite Christmas song and Christmas movie? Song, I'd have to go with All I Want for Christmas. That's a good one. And Christmas movie, normally I would say Elf, but I just recently watched The Grinch. I forgot how good Jim Carrey was in that. He's funny. Yeah. Mine, I would say... Uh, Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. That was my grandma's favorite. So we watch that around Christmas time every year. And song, I would say, This Christmas. That's a good one. Really jazzy. Like it. So thanks for listening to the podcast, guys. Just reiterating, remember to that everyone can be a great teammate and you can really control that. So there's always stuff to work on and there's always ways to become a better teammate so that's something that everyone should look look towards and everyone should strive to do thanks for listening uh let us know how you like the podcast uh we'd love for you guys to rate us on apple Podcasts, spotify or whatever platform you are listening to us on this will allow us to reach a wider audience uh, become better and impact more lives 
If you've ever been a part of Close the Gate or have been following our journey, we would love if you would submit testimonials. It could be a video or text, and this will help others see how much true change Close the Gate can make on life. We love as many questions as possible for new topics to talk about. We want critique. Always strive for the better. You are never too good at something, and this is something that we talked about. We got to be able to accept criticism. And you can always contact us, all of um, Close the Gates social media is at CTG Hoops. Uh, feel free to DM Coach Jack on any of the platforms. Thanks for listening. Peace.